Welcome, Tom. We're really excited to, to meet you, having serialised several of your books so far. So you know that we are big fans of yours. And we're very excited that we're going to be serialising your economics classics. But let's just start with you telling us how you got into this business. Well, I was working as an advisor to ministers in Australia. And um, it was quite high pressure, like we had to um, condense a big issue down into a ministerial briefing and get it all together in like three or four hours, a bit like journalism. And reduce it to what size? Oh, like a page, right. yeah. The so it could, be, it could be boxes and you'd have to turn it into a page? Yes, yeah. The Premier of, of New South Wales or the Minister didn't want to read anything longer. And Cabinet briefings are also like a page, page and a half. How do you get down to 50? We start with a, quite a long list of, of classics in a subject. And so you, you first look at the undeniable classics. And then you look at, say, key books of the last 10, 15 years that have been important. So you yes. want to include a few, you know, fresh ones the last few years to balance it up. So you end up with a, with a list of classics. Um, and I mean, it's never quite scientific. There's always be debate about the classics in, in a subject. So to some extent, it's going to be my view at the end or idiosyncratic but I try to be as objective as possible. Yeah, just looking at the economics books that we're going to uh, be serialising, I mean, you can split them up any way you want, but the classics, the tw you know, I think one way would be the classics, the 20th century giants, and the modern people like Piketty and so on. Yeah. Which are the most relevant f f for today? I mean, do, do the old ones age or...? Um, no, I mean, I think something like Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, never really ages because it says something important about the role of government in the economy and you know how large it should be, how small. So that's always worth reading. Uh, someone like David Ricardo, you know, the, the idea of comparative advantage and free trade, that's continually relevant to today, mm -hmm. you know, globalization and so on. And then, yeah, I'm, I mean, amongst the, the more recent ones, someone like Thomas Piketty, uh, capital in the 21st century. That's if you're interested in in ideas of inequality and uh, concentration of capital and so on. That's a must read. Just to go back to you know the, the, the giants of yesteryear like Freeman and Keynes and further back Smith and Ricardo. Mm. Do we have any of those people around today? Well, you'd have to look at people like um, Krugman and Stiglitz and um, you know the. Taylor has just won the Nobel Prize for economics. But most of them, yeah, I mean, they've written interesting books and so on, and, and they're pundits in the media. But will ever, anyone ever, you know, write what Keynes did, general theory of interest, employment, and money? Probably not. I mean, there's, there's interesting work going on all the time, but it tends to happen in specialised academic areas. You know, that's economics now. It's so specialised, so ideological, um, that the, the scope for people to come along with, you know, some great book like they have done in the past is probably less now. Right. I mean, you, you mentioned or well, two things there. One was Richard Thaler. And, there's a, you know, there's a lot of work being done there, the psychology of economics, uh, the human angle, the nudge theories and so on. Is that just something that's trendy or is it, is it, is it got its own right alongside the, the classical number crunching economists? Oh, I, th I mean, I think that, was, that was, has been quite revolutionary. Behavioural economics is really just a continuation of, of what Keynes said, that you cannot see an economy as a self-regulating thing. It's basically a collection of millions of minds. That's what, I, that's what an economy is. And now we're going to have another massive transformation uh, over the next 10 years. We've got the advent of cyber currencies, artificial intelligence, robotics. Is anyone sort of getting to grips with this or do we have to bin what's gone before because, you know, Keynes never had to deal with uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin? Yeah, well, I, I don't know too much about those new currencies, but I have looked into the you know, effect of the new kind of economy on jobs and so on. And it's interesting that Keynes imagined us, that the whole purpose of economics was so that we wouldn't have to work much or as much in the future. 
And um, so we've gone through what the last 30 years of people working much more than they ever thought <laughs> they would in the past, you know, ridiculous hours. And then now we're going back to this thing of, well, well automation and artificial intelligence get rid of millions of jobs. And in the economics classics, uh, I cover Martin Ford's book, The Rise of the Robots. But in the end, I don't actually agree with it because um, he says this, you know, thousands and thousands of jobs are going to go. I, I agree with this idea that if you want to see what the economy will look like in 10 years time, you just have to look at where rich people are spending their money now. You know, having armies of therapists, advisors, um, trainers, all that sort of thing, um, paying extra health insurance to have carers in their home, all that sort of thing. So, you know, that's, that's going to be, that's going to be legions of jobs in the future, all those areas where, you know, they might be lost in manufacturing, whether they'll be as high paying as they were in the past. Um, it's another issue. It's something that came out of the economics classics when I was writing it was this period, um, Piketty called it the Trente Glorious, the 30 years after World War II, when economies are a lot more regulated and you had more union power and so on, and wages kept on rising and rising each year, uh, a lot more stable period, and all that seems to have gone. There's, there's more people have an opportunity to earn a lot more now but that number is smaller. So, you know, what we've gained in, in freedom, we've probably lost in terms of the multitude's earning power. But have you ever given up and said, I can't summarise this? It's just either it's impenetrable or I don't believe it. Oh, right, yeah. The, I mean, I did uh, Wittgenstein's, I tried doing his logic, Logico Philosophicus Tractatus, which is his really hardcore book about uh, language and analytical philosophy. And when he wrote it, he said, I think only half a dozen people in the world will understand this. And you weren't one. <laughs> I wasn't one of them. You were number seven. <laughs> Brilliant. Tom, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks Thank a lot. you, Lauren. Thanks for coming in. Yeah.